what was interesting is, I don't know if I ever told you this, but um, I used to ring my mum. By the way, my mother's of Irish background, and I do want to touch on this for, in a moment, and I'd say your surname is the same. Um, but I used to ring my mother on my way home probably every night, if not every night, definitely every second night, and just talk to her during that period because I knew that my between my office and my home was about 25 minutes and my mother being Irish could talk. And I knew that I could say, Mum, I'm home. I've got to go inside for my dinner. And that would be the end of my So I'd have a nice fixed period. And I did it for many, many years, like all, all my bit working career whilst I've had a mobile phone. And I remember one night I was talking to my mother and my mother didn't drink. And I talked to my mother and uh, she sounded like she'd been drinking. And my dad didn't mind a scotch every now and then. I said to mum, hey, mum, you had a drink with dad. And she said, no, dear, no, dear, no, no, I haven't had a drink. And uh, I said, you sure? I said, because you slur- sound like you're slurring your words. Anyway, short story, a long story becoming a short story. Um, I got nervous. I didn't know what to do. I never met a neurologist in my life. I bumped into my friend Phil Stricker out here who's a urologist and he p- quickly got me referred to somebody at St. Vincent's, like literally two days later. They did a whole series of tests, which um, we may quickly touch on, but they weren't blood tests or anything like that. They were... They 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 were sort of uh, sensory tests. Um, then she was sent to you guys. Um, within six months, she passed away. One of the things I was I found out or I, I was told is that people with Irish genetics um, have a or Celtic genetics is probably a better way of putting it have a uh, statistically more likely to get this as a genetic disease than other people. Is that the truth, or am I just imagining that? It's the truth. So I remember your mother well, and she's a lovely lady. Um, and as you say, she be, had some slurring of speech, and it turned out that she had motor neurone disease. ALS, we, as it was called. Yeah, ALS. And we call it bulbar onset. So bulbar means the tongue and mouth region. Yeah. And one of the more common genes or genetic processes is called C9 open reading frame 72, C9 off. And that can be traced back to one individual in Finland a thousand years ago. Wow. And then we've seen the movement of this one person and the extended family through Western Europe and then migration from Western Europe to Australia and North America. So every time we find this gene, we find the original Finnish haplotype, the founder. So it's all related to one person a thousand years ago. Interestingly, there's no none of this gene representation in Asia, for instance. So none of it, none of the, the Vikings never made it to Asia. But it's interesting. So you're right. A very high proportion of Western Europeans, and particularly Ireland and uh, Great Britain, United Kingdom. And I was also told at the time, and then I think this is important for people in terms of their habits and behaviours. I was also told at the time that you might have the mutation or the gene. Mutation, mutation, gene, mutated gene, um, which goes back a thousand years. But my mother never got until she's 86 years of age. And I was also told that it needs another um, element to sort of excite that gene into turning into ALS. And at the time, this is many years, this is like seven, eight years ago now, but um, they said either exposure to chemicals, heavy chemicals, alcoholism, which is a problem in Ireland, as we know, and um, severe respiratory infections. Is that a, a, so do, should we, maybe not everyone's going to run it and get a genetic test, but is that sort of quite straight up informing us that we've got to be careful about our behaviours and you know, what we get exposed to? And is there any expansion on that? Am I correct in what I just said? Absolutely correct. I suppose the interesting thing is we're born with these genetic changes. So that's our makeup. Why is it then that some people manifest disease and some people don't? So let's say, you know, an individual has this gene. There's no guarantee that they're going to get the disease. Yeah. So they could, they could die from something totally unrelated at the age of 95 and that gene will never have any play in their life. Presumably, there are compensations going on in the brain and the nervous tissue. So those compensations can keep things under control. And then ultimately, a stress triggers the process of the original cell death. And then there's a sort of a cascade that spreads through the brain or the spinal cord. And we know that if we look at, we've looked at cancer modeling, and we've taken that now into neurology. And if we look at the onset of a disease and the incidence, it's a straight line. 
and the slope of that straight line is six. So six things have to happen right. for you to manifest the disease. If you have a gene, that's three of the steps. So there's another three steps. And as you mentioned, it's a severe stress. So we know it, you know, very extreme cases, someone who gets hit by lightning or they have a get a severe electrical, you know, injury. You've got an entry and exit wound. Motor neuron disease begins in that region. Wow. So that's the stress. And you mentioned then, you know, severe respiratory infection or, you know, severe alcohol. Any of those things could be sufficient to trigger the process. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly how that happens. That's the problem. But it could be, but it could inform us about because you know it's actually healthy not to be an alcoholic. <laughs> it's actually healthy not to be exposed to poisons of, of any type. Um, it's as and it's actually healthy to stay to stay healthy enough not to get a severe respiratory disease. And I recall that my mother actually had a severe flu, the worst chest infection she'd ever had. She lost ten kilos during that period prior to getting the diagnosis and um, I often wonder whether that was the, the very thing that actually catalyzed the whole process. Um, but I, I guess, you know, because this project that I'm undertaking and you're well aware of because I've actually consulted you in relation to myself, um, it's about not really avoiding things that you're never going to be able to avoid. There are some things we're just going to be unavoidable. Eventually something's going to kill us, um, you know, it's going to be heart, we have a degenerative uh, neuro, neurological de, de, neurodegenerative disease, you know, cancer or something like that, because you're not going to, you know, you just don't die. You die of something. Something fails. Um, the question here is about how do I extend my period of not sort of bringing it on myself, and that sort of then talks to to me to be about behaviour. You know, what I get exposed to, or more importantly, what I expose myself to, or knowingly, as opposed to being uh, unwittingly exposed to something, the more I become aware of things, which is what this whole program is about, which is why I got you here today. If I become aware of things, then I might become much more, lot more likely than not to avoid something that might actually cause me a problem. And the simple things: don't drink too much, Mark. Uh, don't go around uh, getting exposed to um, some Monsanto poison. It's simple. Um, try to live a healthy life so you don't get severe COVID or, you know, you might be 70, maybe you should get vaccinated. I know all the anti-vaxxers are now going to send me a text, but it doesn't matter. But you may, maybe it's something you decided because it's your call and you must take, people must take more control of their outcomes. You're a, you're a doctor um, and various other things, but you're a doctor at first hand. How important do you think it is for and that's what this program is all about. But how important is, is it for patients actually to start to take a bit more control of their outcomes? And and when they come to you, say, hey, Matthew, which is what I do because I've got my trusty file here, which I take <laughs> everywhere with me. Sooner or later, I'm going to turn this into some sort of um, dashboard with all my stuff in there. I haven't done that yet. I'm going to, I'm going to get someone to build me a, a, a software, a bit of software to put it all in the dashboard. But how important do you think it is for someone to come and say, but Matthew, I've had these tests done. What do you reckon? Well, I think you – Absolutely correct. And that's where the focus of medicine is now. Can you prevent conditions or can you manage conditions as well as possible? And to do that, you have to have an understanding, but also then you have to be willing to take that message on board and control it. And I think a lot of these things are in, in individual control. So that I think the message that you're bringing across is critically important. We have to understand processes and if we can manage lifestyle factors, we can actually control a lot of these conditions, including neurodegeneration and dementia. Uh, 